Okay, everyone, we're getting ready to start. So, if the folks in the lobby area can be a little more quiet and we can get started with this uh, side chat with uh, John Rowe. Again, thank you all for coming out to Crypto Monday. Uh, this is uh, an ongoing event uh, hosted by Pedro Rivera and Shakira Rivera. And we also have uh, mixers every other Monday, as well as speakers. So the next speaker will be two Mondays from now, not next Monday. But again, we'll have a decent crowd every Monday. we we'll meet new people in the crypto community. And you definitely uh, don't want to miss these conversations that we're having uh, because they're influential to uh, our futures here in Puerto Rico. I know many of you live here now, just like I do. And uh, this looks to be a great series and a great way to meet the people on the island. So uh, I'm Alan Warwick, um, formerly of San Antonio, Texas, now of Carolina, Puerto Rico, and I've uh, been here since September 2nd. I'm a former city councilman for the city of San Antonio, uh, represented uh, 1.7 million for people for three years, and uh, I'm glad, very glad, to be in Puerto Rico uh, with the community here and building community here. Um, we are so blessed to have uh, Yaron Brook with us today. He is the uh, chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and former uh, executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute and also the founder of the uh, Hedge Fund. Uh, he has been speaking about objectivism uh, throughout the world and, and in the United States and uh, now in front of us this evening, uh, Yaron Brook. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're going to have a short Q&A session um, between myself and Yaron, and then we're going to open up to questions from the audience. Uh, I'm sure if any of you have read or listened to uh, Yaron's ideas or hear some ideas that are interesting this evening, I'm sure some questions will pop up. But uh, most of us have read uh, you know, the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrug. How, how many have you read Atlas Shrug? Um, so a minority of us. Does the movie count? No, the movie doesn't count. But uh, they know at least who Iron is. But uh, many of us probably didn't know about the Iron Institute before this evening. So yeah. if you could tell us about the institute and the work that you guys are doing around the world. Sure. So, so for those of you who. Uh, you might not know that much about Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand was a, a novelist and philosopher. She was probably the uh, most prominent advocate of individualism and capitalism uh, in, in the 20th century and uh, had a massive following. Her books were massive bestsellers. Uh, she wrote At the Shrug, for example, in 1957. It still sells hundreds of thousands of copies. It's translated into almost every language on the planet. It sells actually more copies now outside the U.S. and in the U.S. So those of you who have not read Atlas Shrugged, I don't know what to say to you, right? Go home and read the book. It's a must read. It's kind of a cultural standard. Um, and, and my guess is in the crypto world, uh, most people have read Atlas Shrugged. In the technology world generally, I'd say that Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged were probably inspiration for for most of the great entrepreneurs in the tech industry, from Steve Jobs to Michael Dell to Larry Ellison to you know Sam McNeely, Sun Microsystems, and, and of course uh, this generation, I'm sure that is the case as well, although they're less vocal about it, maybe completely correct uh, reasons. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the founder of Uber is uh, was a known um, a known fan of the Fountainhead, another book that everybody everybody should really read. So what made Grant special is she actually uh, presents a philosophy of individualism, of you know that, that is about living one's own life for oneself, rationally, uh, with a long-term perspective, making life the best that it can be, uh, and, uh, and and making the most of it. And, and what we do at the institute is we promote those ideas. We try to get uh, more people to read the books. 
We try to get people engaged in the ideas um, from the, the, the more philosophical ideas through the morality. And then, of course, we apply her philosophy to the events of the day, so to the politics and what's going on in the world. I mean, it was a was the preeminent advocate for capitalism uh, again in the 20th century. Nobody was more of an adamant advocate for capitalism, I think, than she was. And uh, we try to continue that path, to try to argue for capitalism and try to influence the world so that we get more freedom, more capitalism uh, for individuals uh, everywhere in the world. I, I, I spend a lot of time traveling around the world, primarily uh, Europe, Eastern Europe primarily, and uh, Latin America, some Asia, uh, talking about these ideas. There's a massive market globally for these ideas. We're still a tiny minority in terms of those of us who really advocate for freedom and advocate for capitalism, but, uh, but it's growing. And uh, the, 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 the idea is to try to make, try to change the world, try to, try to really have an impact on the world out there. That's great. Are there any projects in Puerto Rico on the island that uh, people could potentially work with or work on to get started? Yeah, none right now. I mean, there are some student groups in, in some of the universities here that are affiliated with the Students for Liberty, with affiliated with kind of a libertarian uh, student group. But other than that, there really isn't anything um, anything going on in the island. Uh, and it's a shame because I think, I think the island, given the mess that it's in, uh, and given the attractive tax uh, benefits uh, is poised to maybe be kind of a laboratory experiment for some of these ideas if we could gain influence within the island and actually have an impact. It's a disaster if we don't because, you know, you, you, you can see, I mean, this island is basically uh, um, dominated by a socialist mentality and by, by uh, a socialist political class which dominates this island. This is, it's, it's not just corruption and cronyism, but it's, it's unions that, that are very, very influential. And it, it's, it really is a, a leftist socialist mentality. And it, if that would change, um, and not just we benefited from some freedom, it goes back 20 and 22, but the Puerto Ricans actually benefited from some freedom, which would be nice. Uh, I, I think this island could, uh, could be a pretty amazing place. Are you doing anything to work to make that happen as far as... I mean, I don't, I'm not spending enough time on the island to make it possible, unfortunately. I'm, I'm open to suggestions, uh, but, but I travel so much, I end up spending six months in a day in Puerto Rico and, and uh, probably about 100 days in, in other countries around the world and the rest of the U.S. Um, but I'm interested in finding ways in which we can have an influence on the island and have an influence on the politics. I think if we're going to spend here the next five to ten years, as I think some of us will, uh, to, to gain the max out of these benefits, we have a strong, uh, you know, self-interest in trying to fix the, the massive problems in Ireland. And while a lot of people think that fixing the problems in Ireland means writing a check or, or doing philanthropy or stuff like that, that's all useless. That's all a waste of time. It's never made anybody successful. It's never helped anybody in a significant way. I mean, it helps an emergency. It helps somebody out of, you know, not living together. But at the end of the day, if you want to really help this island, if you want to help the people in the island, if we want to raise the quality of our lives on this island, we need to have a real significant political impact on what happens here. And we need to tilt this island in the direction of free markets, in the direction of capitalism, in the direction of respecting individual rights. Uh, it's, it's, it's bad enough that they're under American law, which is, you know, rights violated to a large degree. But they impose a whole other set of bureaucracy on top of that, which, which is destructive to Puerto Ricans. And if it's destructive to Puerto Ricans, it's going to be destructive to us. So, uh, you know, I'm open to suggesting in terms of how we organize politically, but, but I, I, I think some political influence is going to be necessary if we want to live a successful life here in the next 10 years. Many of us are here for Act 20 and Act 22, including yourself. Uh, what do you think about the potential changes? Um, there's some legislation that's working its way through uh, the House here, and it, it doesn't seem beneficial to the island, especially with the objective of this idea. Well, they claim it's not beneficial to the island, but that's just that's just the socialist populism. Uh, I mean, it's massively beneficial to the island. Uh, you're bringing in 
uh, you bring in a, a, a large number of well-educated, highly capitalized individuals who have money, who are, who are putting their money in Puerto Rican banks, at least some of their money, hopefully not too much, um, in Puerto Rican <laughs> banks. You know, there's a, you know, the, the, the Puerto Rican banks are not too big to fail. They can fail. I would not, I would not have more than $250,000 in any account in First Bank. I mean, I would open, what I did is I opened an account at, at Bank of America. You can do it online. It, it, you don't have to have an American address. I'll accept a Puerto Rican address. Anything above 250 goes to the U.S. Bank of America will, ne will not fail, right? Because the socialists in Washington won't allow it because it's a too big to fail bank. But First Bank has failed in the past and can't fail in the future. Puerto Rican banks are too small and nobody cares about, nobody's going to bail them out. So your, your, your deposits in Puerto Rican banks are at risk. Yeah. And then that's two months ago. I don't think so. That, well, I mean, uh, 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 unless there's a big uh, tsunami or something. Yeah, probably not. And, and the nice thing about natural disasters is well, you, get, you get the federal government bailing you out because of natural disasters. Because it's a whole other category of socialists who that's what they fund. So, one way or the you know, but I would I would be very cautious. But look, we put money in the bank accounts. We go to restaurants. We we buy real estate. We, you know, some of us might build real estate. Uh, we hire Puerto Ricans, whether it's you know the simple stuff of, of, of cleaning a house, or whether it's or whether it's office jobs, or whatever it is. Or hopefully, uh, more educated Puerto Ricans to, to to work at our hedge funds or whatever. Right. So, you know, <coughs> Act Twenty and Act Twenty Two. Are fantastic. The, the real evil of Act 20 and Act 22 is that Puerto Ricans don't get the benefit. I mean, I understand that they're pissed off. I would be pissed off if I paid 30 percent and there was this one class of citizen only paying 4 percent. I mean, that's pathetic. So, uh, I mean, I have suggested, and I think that the approach that, that should be taken is that we should advocate for lowering everybody's taxes. That is, what we should advocate is a Puerto Rican flat tax. It shouldn't be more than 10%, and it should be on everybody. And I, for one, you know, you guys might disagree, but I, for one, would be willing to raise my taxes to achieve that, because I think my quality of life would go up dramatically. Flat tax on all Puerto Ricans are 10%. But to do that, the Puerto Rican government is going to have to massively restructure itself. Uh, a third of all people employed on the island work for the Puerto Rican government. A third. So I would fire 85% of those tomorrow if possible. Right. And that's good for the Puerto Rican economy, it's good for them. Uh, I would invest heavily in only two things. Puerto Rico as a, as a government has to invest really into only, only two things. Uh, more policemen and paying them more money so they don't take the jobs in Florida. Or the, I don't know if you know about all the police here are leaving. So we're in trouble because crime is going to increase because the police are getting are getting uh, much better salaries in Florida than they are in Puerto Rico. So they're basically leaving and packing up and going to Florida. And we're going to have fewer and fewer, fewer police, uh, which, is a, which is a real problem for all of us who live here. So they should pay more to the police and hire more police. And they should, you know, until we get to the point where we can privatize the roads, which I think we should be, you know, I don't think that's that difficult in a world of GPS. They should at least fix the roads. But other than that, the Puerto Rican government doesn't have to do anything. Everything else can be privatized. Everything else can be, can be you know, uh, uh, left to, to, to the private sector to do. Just shrink them by 85%. Lower taxes by, you know, it's a 10% flat tax across the board, no exceptions, nothing, no deductions, no anything. But also tax everything at 10%. Uh, lower the sales tax, what is it, 11%? Is it not even? Lower that to zero. So a 10% flat tax, income tax, or corporate tax. Make corporate tax, you know Puerto Rico is the largest, second largest, highest in corporate tax in the world. It's like 49%. Right, we pay 4% on our Act 20 companies, they're paying 49%. I mean, it's insanity. No country can survive with corporate tax of 49%. Lower that to 10%. Everything flat across the board, ten percent. Privatize everything, and you know I would I would bring in a couple of uh, fourth generation nuclear power plants. That would that would that would provide electricity for this island forever, 
at a, at a relatively low cost. And you know, these are these are pop plants that can sustain a hurricane, that can sustain a earthquake. These are amazing technologies. And you know, and then you know, my, my theory is once we do all this, an island becomes rich, and uh, and we you know everybody's making a lot of money, and, and it's incredibly successful. Then we secede. Because look at that. Who the hell wants to live under American regulations? Then we secede. But then well, we have to be rich first. You don't secede before you're rich, right? So how long do you think that that would take? And that, I mean, you said five to ten years. But I, and oh, if, like I, if yeah. I were given four rates, it would, it, would, it would take five years to, to get this island back, you know, on track. To get it rich, it would take 10 to 10 20 years where this island is. Is rich, rich like like Hong Kong, rich like things like that. It would take probably 10, 20 to 20 to 30 years to become that rich. But it could be safe tomorrow. All you have to do is hire the police um, and and, uh, and decriminalize drugs. Imagine Puerto Rico implicitly can't because the federal government is involved. But you could decriminalize drugs implicitly by just telling the police to stop enforcing them. And let let the FBI worry about it as it enters the United States. Why why are we getting shot up over here? Over something that is all being consumed in the U.S., which is what all of Latin America should do—they should all decriminalize drugs and, and stop the bloodbath in their own countries and let the Americans suffer the consequences. It's our demand for the drugs that is fueling all these murders all over Latin America. So, speaking of the U.S., uh, midterm elections are happening tomorrow, and uh, we have uh, a number of things that are. Going to impact the states. Is there anything that's going to spill over to impact Puerto Rico possibly? No, I mean, it doesn't matter who wins. They're not going to do away with the Jones Act, which could help us a lot if they did away with the Jones Act. So, primitive, stupid, you know, government regulation that was maybe good during World War II, but should have been abolished in 1945, and, and is still there in order to sustain an American shipping industry, which are American. What is America need a shipping industry? Talk about tribalism in spades. Uh, foreigners do shipping better than we do. Let foreigners do the shipping. So it, it increases the cost of Puerto Rico dramatically. One of the reasons things are so expensive here is because of the Jones Act. So nobody's going to do away with that. Um, no, I mean, I, what, you know, Donald Trump's still going to be president. That doesn't affect us that much over here. Uh, what else? I, I don't know what difference. To, I don't know generally what big difference is going to happen during this election. So the Democrats take the House, which will probably happen. The Republicans keep the Senate, which will probably happen. The Democrats will make life rough for Donald Trump. I can't think of a nicer person it could happen to. Um, you know, uh, I don't think anything dramatically changes in the U.S. or here. Uh, it's not like the Republicans having the House and the Senate and the presidency have done much. Right? They couldn't repeal Obamacare. Uh, they, they, they haven't done anything. They, they've increased government spending. They haven't, from a legislative perspective, haven't reduced regulation in a significant way. So it's as if the Democrats control the House already. It's, it's not like the Republicans did anything. They're like, I mean, the Republicans are, uh, are an incompetent ruling party. They're quite good in the opposition. <laughs> right? But, you know, they, they repealed Obamacare when they were in the opposition. They cut government spending when they were in the opposition because it didn't go through because Obama wouldn't sign it. They, they, they did all these amazing, they actually uh, suggested turning Medicaid into a voucher system, which I think is the only solution for Medicaid. I would like to phase it out, but at least vouchers gives you a mechanism to phase it out. Um, they did all these exciting things and as soon as they got the power to actually put it into play, they backed away from everything. And they, and they, and they increased spending, Regulations all the same. They've done nothing. They've cut taxes, which is the only thing Republicans do. And they didn't cut taxes on individuals that much. So but that's what we're Puerto Rico. You know, they cut taxes that much. We were state of the union. So one of the things that you haven't touched on yet is education. A uh, number of schools have closed in Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah. Your idea is to cut and, and maybe get different objectivist ideas that uh, may potentially work here on the island. What are those and how can we start to put it The only thing that can help save education anywhere, certainly in Puerto Rico, is to get the government's hands off of it. Government 
can't do education. Government only does one thing. There's only one thing government does well, and that is anything that has to do with the government. It's to protect us from invaders and it's to protect us from criminals. That is it. Anything else the government tries to do, taxation. Well, that's a gun, right? Of course, coercion. They're good at coercion. So, they, so when you think government, and this George Washington said this in his, in his inaugural address, I think the second one. He said, government is a gun. That's the essential characteristic of government is force and coercion. I don't want force and coercion in the schools. I don't want that mentality in the schools. So the only moral, ethical, and, and logical thing to do with education is to privatize it, all of it, 100% of it. But you have to do it smart, because you can't tomorrow say, okay, the government's not doing education, we're getting out of it, and, and, and nothing, you know, it would be a disaster. So what you have to do is, the first step is something called education saving accounts. Uh, this, was, this was legislation passed in, in uh, Nevada. The, uh, it passed the House, the Senate, and, there, and the, uh, the governor signed it, and the teaching union sued, and it's in the courts now, so who knows what will happen to that. But this is the idea of an education saving account. I don't know how much the governor of Puerto Rico spends per child in education, but let's say it's $5,000 a year. I, I'd be surprised if it was a lot more than that. But let's say it's $5,000 a year on, on per child in education. What the government would do is they would give you, or give parents, every parent in Puerto Rico, $5,000 in a special bank account, education saving account. And that account you could only use for education. But you get to choose what education. So you can send your kids to a private school. You can homeschool. You can do something on the internet. Whatever it is, you can fund from that account the government has no say in the kind of education you provide, and you are responsible as a parent for your child's education, and you get to spend it. Now, what would happen? Entrepreneurs would enter, the, the, would, would enter and start schools, because there'd be a massive demand for school, but it wouldn't be just demand. It would be a demand with money. People would have money that the government has given them, the $5,000. So entrepreneurs would enter, and the profit motors would try to drive the cost of school down, and the quality up. Isn't that what happens in every field where you allow competition and you allow innovation and you allow entrepreneurship? Prices go down, quality goes up. Steve Jobs, you can find this video on YouTube. It's a video where he's talking about education before he went back to Apple, so during his next days, right? And he talks about the fact that education is, is one of the only products where you don't have advertising. Like, how much time do most parents spend on choosing shoes at a shoe store? More than they spend on choosing which school to send their kids to. We've got all our priorities upside down. Think about all the advertising and the marketing that businesses spend to try to attract your attention. Imagine if schools did that. Hey, our SAT scores are higher than that, you know, anybody else. We train kids to be great artists. We train kids to be what, whatever, right? Imagine hundreds of little schools with, that are advertising and trying to get your attention, trying to get your money, and trying to get your kids. Quality would go up dramatically, the cost would go down dramatically. Now the beauty of the, 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 the important thing about these education saving accounts is that anything you save in them, you can roll into the next year, and you can keep, you know, you keep the money. And if, if, if you save money at the end of high school, you get a roll that into a college fund. And if your kid doesn't get a, go to college, you can withdraw that money, let's assume you have to pay taxes on it. You have to, you can, all the rest is tax free. You can withdraw money tax free. Now, I think that would work in all 50 states of the United States. It would probably work smooth and easy over there because, you know, it's going to be difficult to get entrepreneurs in Puerto Rico. But I think it's doable. And it's... And in my world, I would phase it out, right? So in 20 years, the government would put zero in your bank account, because again, we're gonna be rich in 20 years. All those people out there are gonna be rich in 20 years. They don't need the government to subsidize their education at that point. And now the key is that everybody gets it. It's not means tested. Everybody gets it. Everybody who has kids gets $5,000 into their account, and they can use it. So there's no incentive not to work, so you don't get to become rich, so you don't get the money. Everybody gets it. It's like, uh, 
Anyway, so that would be my solution to education. It's got to be private. The only way you'll ever improve education is by privatizing it. The government will never improve education. So with that, you know, it sounds like a great system. It sounds like something that I would uh, agree to. But what about the equality of opportunity? Uh, I think there are not as many opportunities on the island of maybe because of that 49% tax as far as entrepreneurship. But what would your idea be to maximize and increase the number of opportunities on this island for that Puerto Rico? So let's start by, 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 by this. There is no such thing as equality of opportunity. This is a nutty concept. It's a socialist concept. It's, there's no such thing, right? I work very, very hard so my kids would have a lot of opportunities. So what, are you going to take them away from me? You gonna, how are you going to destroy the opportunities I created for my kids? All of us work really hard for our kids to have great opportunity. There's no such thing. Equality of opportunity is the same as equality of outcome. It means destroying the opportunities that some have created. It means lowering everybody to the lowest common denominator. What I want to do is maximize opportunity. By the way, my book, Equal is Unfair, is all about this topic. I want to maximize opportunities. I don't want to create equality. I want to maximize the opportunities for people to create their own wealth, their own achievements, their own life for themselves. And the question is, how do you do that? Well, you do that by freeing them up, by not taxing them, by not regulating, by not controlling them, by not telling them how to live and what to do and what businesses they can open and how much they can pay their employees. I mean, it's, it's, it's nutty how much of our life today is controlled by government regulations and government controls. Right? You know, one of the most disastrous laws out there is the minimum wage laws, which now their money is 15 bucks an hour. Which, what's that? I thought it was safe on Yeah. It's like probably the worst law. Yeah. For the safe. For the safe. So basically, any employee can sue you. Yes. If you don't track your time to their liking, but they're automatically right. And this is you know, in New York. It's a national. Yeah. So labor laws are awful. Why isn't any of the business of the government how I transact with my employees? What? Why do I have to give everybody benefits? But you know, there are a million things that that it, when you when you grow a business and the business grows a little bit, you suddenly realize that the government is controlling it. So the way to maximize opportunities is to get the government off our backs, to increase economic freedom, to maximize opportunities for entrepreneurs, to create as much wealth as possible, and therefore to create as many jobs as possible. And the way to get people out of poverty is not by giving them a check. The way to get people out of poverty is by giving them a job. And the way you give them a job is by encouraging businesses, not encouraging, just leaving businesses alone to make money by creating jobs. And the way to create jobs is to make money. The more money you make, the more jobs you're going to create. Under your model, the adoption model, how would that be guarding against what happens in the university? So what I mean is, they have a large element of funding when they can get student loans. Yeah. So but collectively, you see what's happened to the cost has gone like that. Has gone like that. And part of it is part of the criticism for our higher education systems is, you know, they're spending on something like, okay, they've got a great gym facility and all this stuff, and, but our undergrad, I mean, we're known for our grad schools, but our undergrad and high school on down is horrible relative to the rest of the world. So, so let, let me, me, let me, let me ask you this. That. Imagine there was a government program, and the government program said, no matter what an iPhone costs, We'll fund 80% of it. We'll give you a loan for 80% of it at below market rates. And you'll get 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, to pay it back. What do you think would happen to prices of iPhones? They would go way up, right? Because I'm giving you a loan. I'm not even checking your credit worthiness. By the way, I won't check your credit worthiness. I'll just fund your iPhone. And I, can't, I won't take the iPhone back from you if you default. You know, you'll go back up, but I won't take the iPhone from you because I can't take it. So you're setting up a system in the United States where the government is saying, well, oh, the universities can stay kind of private, but we will fund 80% of the tuition of any kid who wants the tuition at any price point that is available. And we won't check the kid's credit rating. And we don't care what degree you get. So if you go and study, I don't know, anthropology or English or gender study, even better, and you can't get a job afterwards, 
we, we don't care because we're just lending you money. No bank would do this, right? So imagine if the government said tomorrow, we're stopping to fund college education. Zero. It's gone. We're not lending anybody any money ever again. <laughs> what would happen to tuition? <laughs> go with that. What would happen to tuition? It would crash. Tu tuition would come dramatically down. Universities would fire all the. You know. You know where the tuition goes. Where does all this increase in in, in money go? Because professors, you know, they make a good living, but they're not like zillionaires, and and it's not like if, if salaries of professors went like this. They didn't. Right. So at least professors went up, but they didn't go anywhere near as much as tuition has gone up. So that's not where the money went, right? Um, you'd think they'd hire more professors and the student-teacher ratio would shrink, right? Better education because it's more expensive. No. Number of students per professor is exactly the same as it was 30 years ago, 50 years ago. That hasn't changed one bit. So where's the tuition gone? These amazing, I mean, they, what, what, some kids are paying $80,000 a year to go to some of these schools. I mean, they, we are as taxpayers subsidizing that. 